are some helps. If you want some materials to hand out to folks, there's invitations to church and, uh, and stuff back there for your, for your use. So grab some of it and take it and hand it out to friends and family. If you've been with us a longer than a week, you know we have a tradition. And if it's your birthday and we know it, and just so happens we have a birthday today. Sophia, thank you for visiting us today. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. If you know of somebody, of a loved one, you can rat them out. Just let me know on that day, and, uh, and we'll make sure they're embarrassed real good. We love you so much. It has to be on the Sunday. That's right. Let's, let's stand on, and, uh, uh, well, you know, we can sit. It's up to you. I, I always like to stand, <laughs> and, you know. I, I just worship. Look. Just do what you want. <laughs> go from your spirit home. i uh-huh. 
touch our hearts, Lord, as we come, as we worship you, Lord. Purify us. You may be seated.
things present nor things to come can ever separate us from your love, the love that you have for us in Christ Jesus. Lord, who gave all for us, Lord, you gave all. How much more will you give to us what we need in the Holy Spirit and through life and godliness? Thank you, Lord God. May our hearts be attuned to your word this morning, Lord. May our May our minds be ready to grasp and comprehend, Lord, the height and the depth and the breadth of how awesome you are, Lord, and how you are at work in everything, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. Receive our worship, Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that all God's people say, Amen. 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 This time we'd like to dismiss the youth to the youth fellowship. And in the rest, let's go ahead and we'll stand and we'll sing one more. And Pastor Bob will come forward.
there is no one like you there's nothing else to compare you to for you are far greater and superior to anything that we could even begin to observe or imagine lord you are great and awesome you're a good good father you are truly our savior our provider you are everything that we have need of we pray god this morning as we continue to worship you and the study of your word that you would open up our hearts Speak to us, Lord, through your word. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just descend upon us and, Lord, minister to us, each one of us, right where we're at. We pray, God, this morning, as always, Lord, your word has something in particular to speak to each one of us. So have your way, we pray. Bless us, and we commit these things to you now in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. While you're sitting down, if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. So, as it is in many places within the Bible, the chapter and verse divisions don't always really match up with the, the thought that is there. And in this case, chapter 20 should be a part of chapter 19, or chapter 19 should be a part of 20, whichever way you want to look at it. But the chapter and verse divisions were not inspired by God. They were done by well-intending men who've done an absolutely wonderful job. And I say that because had we not had that This morning, I would have said, open up your scroll to Matthew and keep rolling and rolling and rolling until we get to this place here. But they were gracious enough to give us divisions so that we can say, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, and we can all go there without any difficulty whatsoever. But the thought continues from chapter 19. And we we started this out with Peter's question, which was in response to to he asked the question about the fact that they had given up everything that they had for the sake of the gospel for the sake of following after the lord and then what would they get in return for that and that was prompted the question was prompted by the rich young ruler who had many goods had many things and he'd come to jesus and said what must i do to have eternal life and jesus told him you know, that you need to obey the commandments. And he said, well, I've done all that from my youth. And he said, okay, then sell all you have and give to the poor. And it says that he had much goods and that he left there sorrowful because he didn't want to part with those things. And so then that's when, you know, Jesus said that it is really, it is more difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And it's because of the attachment, of course, to the, to the possessions, an unwillingness to let things come between them and the Father. And in other words, that's not so much, Jesus was not saying, and not, not so much, he was not saying that having possessions was wrong. He's saying that possessions having you is wrong. 
And when you would rather have that than you would God, then there's a problem that is there. God will not allow us to have idols, and that is an idol, because anything that we put before the Lord becomes an idol, and it can be issues in our heart or life, possessions. It can be many, many different things. So anything that would come between us is something that God wants us to get rid of. And so then when Jesus had said this to his disciples, that's when Peter spoke up and he says, well then, you know, we're, we've given up everything. What do we get in return? And the Lord was very gracious in his response to them. He said in verse 28 of chapter 19, so Jesus said to them, assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, will be last and the last first. So Jesus says to them, look, you guys, the 12, those guys that really had abandoned it, everything else. He said, this is what you're going to end up with. You're going to be sitting on 12 thrones. Now, that's not a promise to all of us. That's only a promise to those men. And as a matter of fact, the parable that we're going to look at this morning deals with that whole issue about how God gives, how God rewards for those who serve him. And he's going to put it in perspective on how, you know, how some of us who were first will find that they're not going to be treated something more special than those who are coming in last. Immediately when I read that verse, which it's also reported or recorded, I'm sorry, in chapter 20, verse 16, where Jesus says that again. He says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Now, I have to admit, we, we love to use that verse to our advantage, don't we? When I see all the guys running up to the front of the line when we're getting ready to have a coin and a you know food or a coin and a food, I say, look, you know the first shall be last and the last shall be first, so you better get back to the end of the line. So we use it, you know, for our advantage whenever we can. But there's a whole lot more to that than than that, and so we want to look at that this morning as we go through this parable um, and Jesus is teaching on that very thing about the first shall be last and the last shall be first because then he gives them by way of parable he says for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire labor laborers for his vineyard now just to give you a visual on this i don't know how many of you i have a lot of occasion to go to home depot early in the morning because, you know, doing some project, whether it's at home or down here at the church or whatever it may be, I pull into the parking lot and there is a little band of guys that are right there early in the morning. They are there when Depot is opening up a little bit before because they're hoping to get hired as a day laborer. They're hoping that, that what you're going to do is you're going to have somebody, a need for somebody to come and help you out on your project and that you'll hire them. And so it's a common practice today, but it's also the way that it worked back in this time too. And when it came to harvest time, like so many of the farmers here in the valley, they have guys that work for them year round, maintain equipment, do different things, that kind of stuff. But boy, when it comes to harvest time, they take on a whole lot more people into their crew so that they can get harvest done. It is, it is crazy during that time of year. And if you've ever been around it, you know, it is like, it goes 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, because of the machinery, the lights, everything that we got. So you can imagine what it was like in their day, the same thing, but without, you know, that kind of machinery. So the landowner, he goes out and he's looking for guys to hire as day laborers. Verse two, now when he had agreed with the laborers, for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. A denarius a day would have been a day's wages for a man. And so, you know, the landowner is saying, look, I'll pay you for a, a day's work, you know, a day's wages. And they all agree. They said, this is great, you know. And, and then, and he went out about the third hour. 
Okay, so now the first thing would have been close to dawn, somewhere around 6 a.m. in the morning when he goes out and he hires the initial crew. Well, then he comes along at the third hour, which is 9 a.m., and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Now, it's really, I think, important that we take note here that he doesn't say, I'll give you a, a denarii. He says, whatever is right, I will give you. And so it begins to kind of set it up. There's an expectation that there's probably going to be less money for him because he's working for less amount of time. Not a full day, so maybe not a full day's wage. So, verse 4 it says, and, and uh, verse 5, I'm sorry. And again, he went out about the sixth hour, which is around noon, and then again in the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., and he, said, and he did likewise. In other words, he told these guys, go on out there, you know, work in the field, and I'll do you right. I'll pay you what is, what is fair. Verse 6, in about the 11th hour, which is 5 p.m., he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. You see, there was plenty of work that was to be done and there was no reason for these men to be standing there idly. There was, there was a job available, but they just hadn't been asked and so they're still there. And so when the landowner sees it, he says, no, he says, you go out. Now, be mindful of this. At five o'clock in the afternoon, there's only about an hour's work left. They're going to quit around six o'clock in the evening. And so he's telling them, you go out for an hour and you work. Even though it seems like, oh, it'd just be a little, little time. Why even bother? Now, as we're looking at this parable, I want to keep it within the context because there's a couple of things I want to say that, uh, that we understand that the, the context of this parable is that Jesus is talking about how God rewards those who come and work in his vineyard, those that serve him. But there's a couple of things I think that we need to take note of here as well. And that is this, is that when it says that they were standing around idly and he says, there's no reason for that. You come and you, and you serve in my field. You come to the harvest. That we need to understand that when we begin to apply the parable to our own lives, that this is something that speaks right to you and me. There's no reason for us to be idle in our service to the Lord. There is plenty of work to be done. And it doesn't matter. It may seem to you that, oh, you know, it's too late. There's only an hour left. You know, what can I get done in an hour? And sometimes we look at that and we think about that even in our own life, right? Ah, oh, man, I don't have that much time left. What could I possibly do? How could I start a ministry? How could I, you know, get that involved with a ministry? I'm an old man. What can I do? Well, for years and years and years, man, Caleb uh, has been an inspiration to me in my life. And this is when I was a young man. I used to say, man, when I get to be 80, I want to be like Caleb. I want to be strong. I want to be able to have the confidence. I want to have the zeal for God that says, give me the hill country. Give me the high country. I can still take it. You know, that's an 80-year-old man saying, I'll go fight with them 20-year-old kids and I'll kick their rumps. That's the attitude. That's the heart that God wants us all to have and to understand that even if the time seems short, it doesn't matter. We can still do it. We can still participate. We can still be a part of it. And he calls us to do that. He petitions us. You know, they said, oh, you know, nobody's asked us. Well, guess what? Jesus is asking. He's asking who will come and, and who will be a part of the great harvest. You see, in Matthew chapter 9, I don't know if you remember when we were there, in verses 37 and 38, it says that Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. It's still 
was real then and it's still real today, even more real today. We need to be people of the harvest. We need to be people who are working in the field of God. And it's not, there's no justification for standing around idly because God is asking you to come and be a part of it. All you have to do is be willing. And he's going to be fair and he's going to be just in everything that he does. In Ephesians 2, verse 10, verse that you're very familiar with, I'm sure, we, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is what we are predestined to. We are predestined as believers in Christ to good works. Those things which God has prepared beforehand. He, has, he wants to equip us. He will equip us. He never calls us to anything, but that he will not give us the ability to be able to do it. And 99% of the time, it is beyond your abilities to be able to do it. And then that way, God gets all the glory instead of us. You know, believe me, I feel that way about myself all the time. Lord, you should have called somebody else. Somebody who's smart. Somebody who's got it together. Somebody that's got a memory. Man, my memory's going. Trying to memorize scripture. And it's more difficult now to retain it. I can memorize. I got a good short-term memory. But boy, when it comes to, you know, six months down the road, Man, I can't remember. I can't recall it word for word. I can't recall the, the address of it and that kind of thing. It frustrates me to no end. Lord, you should have called somebody else that had the ability to be able to do those things. Anything that's good that comes out of my life, I got to tell you, man, I give all the glory and all the credit to the Lord because it's well beyond me. It's not based upon my abilities. It's not even based upon my goodness. It's all about God and what he is doing in our lives. And he's created us for those things. It's important to note that with each one of the land, the landowner promised that he would be fair to them. In John's gospel, chapter four, verse 35 and 36, it says, do you, do you not say there is still four months, then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. You know, to be honest with you, God could demand that we do things. He could command us to do it and he could also make it to where you can't resist that command. He's powerful. He's all powerful. And he can do that. But instead, what he does is he entreats us. He, he asks us to come and to participate and to understand that as unworthy as we are of anything at all, he says, if you'll do that, then I'm going to reward you. I'm going to give you what you really don't deserve. You deserve to serve God for zero. You realize that, right? Zero. But God, in his grace and his mercy, he says, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to bless you. If you will come and you will serve, then this is what's going to happen. That you will reap. You will reap eternal life and also the fruit in your life that comes. Receive wages and gather fruit for eternal life. Verse 8 in our text. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed uh, that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. So it appears that in our parable, there's a purpose in giving to those who were called to work in the field first as last rather than first. You see, and part of that is, I am sure, is because that as they watched it, you know, if, if I had said that I was going to work for a denarius, and then I watch Paul come at five o'clock in the afternoon, and I say, well, he's a lazy bum. He's just been standing around all day. He doesn't do anything. 
he's not going to get as much as I am. And when he gets a denarius, I'm thinking to myself, whoa, man, if the landowner gave him one, that means that I'm probably going to get a raise. I'm going to get two. And they had it in their heart that this is something that was going to happen. And when it didn't, they got very disappointed. As a matter of fact, uh, they actually even got angry about the whole thing. In verse 11, and when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to the last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So this whole thing about the evil eye is actually a Jewish idiom. And uh, it, it really means to be covetous, envious, uh, to be, you know, where it's like, no, I should get what they have. And that's why he challenges them. He says, is your eye evil? Is that what you're doing? Are you, are you being that way? God has the right to do as he chooses. This we know, and that he is more than fair in whatever he does. You know, he's more than fair. I look at this, and I certainly would put myself in that category of the one who comes at the end of the day, and I still get great riches and great reward. I think of the thief on the cross. You know, that guy that was there, uh, he had eternal life. He called out to the Lord at the last moment, and he had eternal life. He got his reward, and he's going to have the same reward that you and I do even though he entered in at the last moment. I think of this, and I think about those who have made a decision for Christ years ago in their life. You know, I've shared often about a friend of mine who I knew accepted Christ when he was four years old. And, and he and I will have the same reward when we get there, even though I was 22 before I ever came to faith in Christ. But he did it when he was four. You see, in verse 16, it says, So the last will be first, and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. You know, we may think that someone like Billy Graham will have more reward than others. But this is what I think. I think that we may be surprised that the single mom who worked hard and poured Jesus into her children all their lives will have as much, if not more, because she was faithful in what God had called her to do. You see, if Billy Graham didn't do what he did, he would have been unfaithful to what God had called him to. And so definitely his reward would have been far less. And, and this is, you know, when we're thinking about this, we have to think about stewardship. We, we have to think about how God entrusts to us his precious works. We have that calling, of the ministry to go out and to share the gospel with the lost. We have that calling to minister to one another. We have that, that calling to, to come alongside one another, to strengthen, to encourage, to build up. And, and the scriptures are clear that God has given to one of, each one of us the gifts that we have need of in order to be able to accomplish that. And he's given us all differing gifts so that no part of the body lacks He's got callings for some to be hands, some to be feet, some to be eyes, some to be noses, ears, toes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on until it comprises the whole body. And the whole body then is able to work together for the good of carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ into the world. You know, we have a, a, a time in which we're living in today that can be somewhat disheartening, to be honest with you. I see what's going on politically. I, this whole thing with Judge Kavanaugh, I got to tell you, just between you and me, man, I can't listen to the news because as soon as I start listening to all this boulder dash, anger begins to well up in my heart. And to me, it's very clear. It's a, it's a clear dividing line between that what is right and that what is not. 
and those who are on the side of what is wrong. And when I say that, I'm, I'm talking uh, in general terms here, and I'm also talking about when I say that which is wrong, it is those things that are opposed to God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? So I'm not calling every person who is on the left that they're something, you know, a monster or something like that, nor do I say that everybody that's on the right is a saint, either one. But to me, it's very clear the tide of leading this country towards a very ungodly, man-centered government was stemmed. And now they're upset because that, that pull back over towards conservatism, you know, is too much. You know, think about this. They have actually made statements about how they want to rewrite the Constitution. They feel that it's an outdated document. The Constitution is the only thing that's held this country together for over 200 years. Putting Kavanaugh in the court, who is a constitutionalist, who believes in the Constitution, is diametrically opposed to many who are in the Senate. And that's why you have this, this adamant resistance to him becoming a Supreme Court judge, because they recognize that he will pull us back towards, at the minimum, center. center. Now, I say all that because whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I, I don't really care. I'm not trying to make a political statement about it, to be honest with you. What I'm trying to express to you is that my sense of where we're at and the difficulties that are going on brings frustration to me and almost a sense of hopelessness at times. I said almost, because once I recenter my thoughts and my hearts back on the things that's important, God's kingdom, the harvest, and being a worker in the field, then all that goes away. And so I stay away from listening to the news because it has a tendency to pull me away from that and to pull me back over in this other area that I don't really care to be in. And I know this. God has called us to pray for those who are in authority over us. I know this, that God is in control. I know that at some point, sometime in the history of the United States, we must lose our position as a superpower in the world because of the fact that we are not mentioned in the last days. I don't think we're going to be there other than being a part of the conglomerate of the nations that come to under the rule of the Antichrist. I believe that all these things are true and that it must happen. And so because of that, I find peace. You see, because God's ways are not my ways, I don't understand like he understands. He knows and I don't know. And that's exactly what we are being told here about the whole idea about those who come at first and they receive their reward and those that come at the end, they receive their word, their reward, and that there is this equity in the sight of God and that he does what he desires to do in how he rewards those who come to him in faith. Like I said, Billy Graham, he, has to, he had a calling and he fulfilled that calling. There's very little doubt in my mind at all about that. You know, and even though he may himself have thought at different times he could have fulfilled it so much better, us on the outside would look at that and say, how could you possibly? But I've got to tell you, I know that there are going to be, that there are going to be grandmas who are there in heaven who are faithful and praying for the grandchildren and children and everybody else and that they're going to be right there alongside him when it comes to the reward when it comes for, when it comes for the time where god gives out they're going to be a part of that you see like i said it's about stewardship it's about taking care of the things that god has entrusted to us and being faithful as being faithful to what god does and to use it for his glory God is the one before whom the one before whom all accounts will be settled. Be settled. Many who have prominent places will someday find themselves demoted, and many who often find themselves at the end of the line will find themselves promoted to the head of the line. So remember that guys when we go to eat. Remember that as you're following after the Lord. That God is fair and just. Verse 17, Jesus going <clears throat> up to Jerusalem 
took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and, to the scribes, and, they, will con- uh, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. The Lord tells us things of the future to prepare us beforehand. Before it gets there, the Lord tells there. The Lord tells us about there. there are many things within the scriptures, within the scriptures that we can scriptures that we can that tell us about the days that we're living in. Second Timothy chapter three. If you read through that whole chapter, Paul is telling Timothy what it's going to be like in the last days. And I got to tell you, I read down through that list, and it's a who's who of who's in the church today when you look at a lot of the things that they say that are going to take place. The fact is, is that people seek out after teachers who will soothe their itching ears. They don't like what's being said when it comes from the Word of God. No, I want somebody to tell me that I can live a carnal life and be just fine. Don't call me to righteousness, holiness, and truth. And truth. Let me, let me just walk the way I want to and make the way I want to make me feel good about it. And there are plenty of those that are out there today that will do that. And some, let me just say this, the largest church in the United States is a feel-good church. Joel Osteen, they boast of over 65,000 people in their church. And he has no preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No call to commitment to die to self and to live for God. It's all about God wants you to be happy. God wants you to have this, and he wants you to have that. And you just need to accept that. And because of that, people flock to his message. As you notice, we don't have 65,000 people in here this morning. Just a small observation, okay? I don't expect it to, to get large. This simply because of that. When you just speak the truth and you talk about God and his word and the call that he has on our lives to die to yourself, it's not a popular message today at all. And Paul made it very clear that in the last days, this is how it's going to be. Men would seek pleasure. They would love pleasure rather than being lovers of God. They would want the things of this life rather than the things of God. There's all these things that that he prepares our heart for. So it should not surprise us that the days that we're living in today are as they are. Not at all. God forewarned us. He's told us about it before it gets there so that we can be prepared. Like I said, in my view of the whole thing that's going on politically and where where it starts to pull me towards and where I get back to and part of that comfort is knowing that God said that the days would be as they are in these last days. Jesus had told his disciples in both chapter 16 and 17 of Matthew of this event. Yet, when it came time for the Lord to be crucified, they forgot that he said that he would rise the third day. This is not the last time that he's going to tell them that he's going to Jerusalem, that he's going to be crucified, and that he's going to rise again on the third day. And, And they just missed the whole point. They missed the purpose of his coming. They missed his message to them, the forewarning. Jesus had told them enough that when he was crucified, they should not have ran in fear and hid. They should have known that victory was just around the corner. Yes, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming, and that's when the resurrection will happen. Everything's going to be great. Instead, Women went to the grave. He wasn't there. They brought word back to the guys. And the guy said, oh, you're crazy. Get away from us. He hadn't risen from the dead. But he had, just as he said that he would. Verse 20, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine, mine may sit, one on your right and one uh, right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. So here you have any, any good mother that you can think of, okay? Uh, but particularly a good Jewish mother, right? You can just see a rabbi, 
Rabbi, Rabbi, would you grant to me? You know, at least I can see it, you know. Maybe I didn't do a good, you know, Jewish mother very well, but, you know, I should have done a Jewish father, but that's not who's in our story, okay? But so here's the thing. She comes to him, and certainly she's not understanding what's going on. You know, she doesn't understand that the kingdom is yet to come, and it's not going to come this time. It's going to be at his second coming. They're not catching the whole thing. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. He's going to rise again. They're missing the point. And they have a, a preconceived idea of how things should be and could be and the way that they want them to be. And so they just refuse to hear what is being said. That's a danger that you and I have in our lives too. And that is that we can have a preconceived idea about how things ought to be, how we want them to be, and how we feel they should be. But if God is trying to tell us something different, sometimes we can't hear him because we refuse to listen. It's not because he's not speaking. I am confident of that. And I can also say in, in my own life, there have been times I look back on it and I go, man, if I had just listened, if I had just listened, I would have heard what the Lord was trying to say to me all along. And instead, I had to find out the hard way about it. Because God will have his way with me because I love him and I desire to do his will. And so whatever he wants to accomplish, he's going to, you know? And it's the old adage, we can do this the hard way or we can do it God's way. I want to do it God's way. I want to have that kind of an ear. I want, I want God to quicken my heart and my ears so that I might hear, and not only just hear with my ear, but also with my heart, that I might know and understand what the will of God is in my life. And God is faithful that he will communicate to us if we will simply ask him. And we are, we are told to ask, but not to ask with doubting. Because when we doubt, we're like a man tossed to and fro by the waves of the sea. Is, is this what God wants? Is this what God wants? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Oh, God, please just speak to me. Tell me so that I can do it. Oh, no, you want me to do that? That was my experience before I became a pastor. Lord, I'll do anything. I'll, whatever you want me to do to serve you, I will do it, Lord. I don't care whatever it is, you know. I, I just want to be obedient to you. Great, I want you to be a pastor. Nope. <laughs> anything but that. I told you my story about when I was in Bible school and praying to the Lord. Lord, I'll go anywhere that you want me to go. And he says, I want you to go to Salt Lake. My heart sank. I said, oh, Lord, no. Not there. There's a lot behind the story, but it, the story is that the Lord spoke to me and said, don't tell me you'll go anywhere I ask you to go. Because I really wasn't asking in sincerity, and that was revealed in my heart, because I said, I'll go anywhere you want me to. And he said, all right, how about Salt Lake? Mm, no. I was in Bible school at the time. There was, I mean, I was just battling week after week after week with cultists. They were coming to my door. I mean, it was every week. Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, the list just kept going on and on and on. And it was every week. And I was so tired of the fight. So tired of it. And when he said Salt Lake City, I thought, 24-7 fighting with these guys? I said, no, Lord, call Terry Long. And so he did. <laughs> Actually, I didn't even know Terry at that time. But God did call Terry out there, and, uh, and boy, he's been the guy. He, he, he stands toe-to-toe, -to -toe and he loves them, and he battles with them all at the same time, and that's a good thing. But the point being, sometimes we ask, we don't want to hear, and when he does say, we don't want to listen, and that's where we fall into the same kind of category as these who are hearing that Jesus is saying, we're going to Jerusalem. This is obvious. They're on the, on the road. They're headed there. So it's not like, oh, wow, I guess we're going back the other way. No, they were headed that way. Jesus is telling them once again these things so that they know and understand what's going on. Hey, we're going to Jerusalem. There's going to be a feast that's going to be there. They're headed back for, for, the, for Passover. And, uh, you know, they're probably thinking, all right, hallelujah, we get to go eat lamb tonight. You know, that kind of thing. Jesus says, no, there's more to this. 
I'm going there, the chief priest and those guys, they're going to take me captive, they're going to abuse me, they're going to crucify me, I'm going to die, and on the third day I'm going to rise again. Well, wait a minute, no, Passover is a really good time. It's a great celebration. It lasts for weeks. Seven days, 40 days, whoa, man, party, 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 as grandpa would say. <laughs> party, party, party. And he says, no, guess what? We're going this direction. But they missed it. So, verse 21, and he said to her, what do you wish? And he, she tells him what? In verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So the fellas, the boys, they're standing there and Jesus is talking to them. Hey, do you, under, you don't understand what you're asking. Are you able to go through what I'm going to go through? And they are like Peter. You know, we always give Peter a rough time about opening their mouth and sticking in their foot, right? How about these guys? They said to him, we are able. They don't even know what they're getting into. Oh, yeah, we can do it. We know we can do it, you know. All they were concerned about was their position, not what they were getting ready to go through. Verse 23, so he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Jesus indicated they would indeed share the cup of suffering and death with him. And they did. James suffered death early in the church at the hands of Herod Agrippa. We find that in Acts 12, uh, 1 through 2. And John is thought to have died, is thought to have died of martyrs death near the end of the first century. Now, John lived a long time. He, he lived well beyond any of the other apostles but he still died a martyr's death just as Jesus said that they would verse 24 and when for when the 10 heard it they were greatly dis they were greatly displeased with the two brothers up until the crucifixion of Christ there was a tension within the disciples as to who was going to lead the group who was going to be the greatest this was something they discussed and they discussed and argued over often and because, you know, they want, one wanted to sit on the right, one wanted to sit up. These are two positions of authority. In a kingdom, you have a king that sits on his throne, and the right-hand man, this is his top dog. Left-hand man, he's second in command. And so you have the right and the left, and this is where they want to be. They want to have that position of authority. So when the ten heard that the two were in there trying to horn in, they got upset. And there was a tension that they had. You know, the... the glorious thing is is when you read through the scriptures after after the resurrection of christ that doesn't it's not an issue anymore clear leaders rose up from within the church and you didn't hear that everybody was rising up and going wait a minute no way i'm not going to follow that peter you know i'm not going to do that i'm not going to do that the tension left and left and part of that is i believe because they realized that as jesus will teach them here in a moment about humility and service that this was the main point of being apostles. This account illustrates again that the disciples did not understand Jesus' teaching of, about humility that we looked at in chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Peter's question in 1927 also, which was, you know, what are we going to get out of this, right? Also demonstrated a desire for position, this the disciples continue to discuss even to the point of the Lord's death all the way up to that time verse 25 but Jesus called them to himself and said you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who are great exercise authority over them Jesus was aware of the friction evident within the group so he called the 12 together and reminded them of some important principles while well, some people or rulers and high officials lorded over others, the disciples, the disciples were not to do so. This is a problem um, even within the church today. There are those that, that try to exercise authority over the people rather than humbly being a servant leader, leading them, directing them, guiding them in the direction that they should go, showing them by example but instead exercising authority 
over others, which God has not called us to do. God has authority. God is the one who has authority over all, over all. And we are submitted servants to lead others to the same place of submission before Christ. Verse 26, and yet not so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant, your servant. In verse 27, and whoever desires to be first among you, let him, among you, let him be your slave. Greatness in the Lord's kingdom does not come through rulership or authority, but through service. And this is what he tells us here. Their goal should be serving, not ruling. Those most highly esteemed will be those who serve those who are humble. That's the ones that are going to be highly esteemed. Those that will find people will follow them because they're leading them, they're serving them and leading them to Christ. Verse 28 just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. There's no greater example of the principle than the Lord himself. Jesus does not call us to do anything that he did not do himself at all. He never does. He calls us to humbly submit, to follow him, the Father. He calls us to humbly submit to one another, to serve one another, not to lord it over if we're in positions of authority because Jesus didn't. Even though he could have, if there's anybody that had the right to lord it over anyone, it would be he. But he set us an example. It says here that he did not come to be served. There is no one that deserved to be served except for him. He deserved it. None of us deserve it at all. But yet, he didn't come for that purpose. And as a matter of fact, when we think about John chapter 14, where it is that Jesus began, wait a minute, I'm sorry, 13, where Jesus begins to wash the disciples' feet. Even Peter, old knucklehead Peter, he realizes, whoa, no, you shouldn't be washing feet. I should be washing feet. You're the, you're the teacher. You're the rabbi. You're the guy. You shouldn't be washing feet. I should be. And Jesus did it. And he told Peter, I can't wash your feet. I can't have nothing to do with you. He said, don't stop there. Wash my whole body. Jesus says, those that are clean only need their feet washed. They don't need a bath. And then at the end of it all, Jesus says, you know, you guys call me teacher. You call me Lord and rightfully so. And you see what I have done. I have served you. Now, likewise, do that one to another. Serve one another in that way. Now, we don't need to wash feet. I know there, I mean, if, if people, churches do have foot washing services, you know, I'm not saying, oh gosh, that's just ridiculous. They shouldn't and that kind of thing. Let me just say this. There was a purpose for that at that time. It was a practice. It was a filthy job. And when you did something like that, you were really humbling yourself. But I think there are other ways that we can humble ourselves to one another in the body of Christ, serving one another. If we just are available, we will find that we will serve others and we will find that there will be things that God calls us to do clearly. Jesus had told them on a number of occasions that he would die, but he had not indicated the reason for his death. Now it was clear that his death would be to provide a ransom. The word that is used here in the Greek is, it means payment. And it says a ransom for, and, and the word is anti, and it means in place of, in place of. In other words, it's a payment in place of the debt that we owed for the many Jesus did this. For all that will call upon his name. Jesus came to serve the Father and to serve others. This is the example that Christ has set for us and one that we should do as well. Serve the Father, serve others. He's called us to be the workers in his field and he is fair. He will treat us more than fair. In my opinion, he's fair and just which makes serving him just that much easier. It's easy to serve God because he is a good, good father. Because he has so many blessings for you and I that as we serve him, just in the service alone brings tremendous joy in our heart. 
if we're not if, if we're not doing that it's hard to explain what that really means until you're dying to yourself and you're giving to others and you're serving them and you have that sense in your heart of obedience to God and you're walking in such a way that you're blessing others you in turn will be blessed as well Jesus said that he was going to take the place in Romans 3 23 it says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory that payment that was due he paid for us the payment for sin is death as it tells us in Romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord with all of that it tells us that God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us you know, I've talked with people and they've indicated to me that what they felt they needed to do was get themselves cleaned up, you know, before they go to church, before they come to God. You know, here's the thing. Christ loves us just as we are. We don't need to get cleaned up. That's his job. That's what he does. When we come to him and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all our unrighteousness and to take all that filth out of our life, he cleanses us and he purifies us. He's the only one that can. We'll never be able to clean up ourselves enough to where we feel worthy to come into his presence. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is, of course, that if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I know this group of scriptures there in, in Romans. It's called the Roman road. It, it's a way that if, if you're going to share with somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a great way to lead them through the very things that are necessary that they know and they understand that you're a sinner and that you're separated from God, that you need a savior. But it doesn't leave us there. It gives us that hope. If you'll confess and you'll repent, if you'll believe that he rose from the dead, that he's the one that paid the price for our, our sins, then guess what? Remember when we started out talking about working in the field and the wages? That's the wages that you receive. Not the wages of sin, but the wages of righteousness, which is eternal life. Never forget that. I realize that almost everybody I'm speaking to out here this morning, I know, and I know that you know the Lord. Hopefully, thinking upon those things refreshes your heart and your mind. And if it doesn't, it should encourage you to know that and remember it so that you can go out in the field and do the work that God has called you to do to share the gospel with others. We're going to get there eventually when we get to the end of this gospel. And we're going to see the Great Commission that Christ gave to the church to go out into all the world to preach the gospel and to make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all things that Jesus has taught us. That's, that's what God has called us to. So this morning, no matter where you're at, if you don't know Christ, I want you to know you can. It's a real simple thing. We confess. We make that decision to acknowledge Christ and to ask Him to forgive us of our sin, come into our heart, and that He will indeed forgive us and give us eternal life. If you know Christ, I hope you're challenged this morning about going out into the field. You see, you're out in the field every week. Whether or not you're doing the work that God has called you to is, the, is the, really the big question. I know you're all out in the field. But are you being obedient? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you praying, God, would you put my path to cross with somebody today that I can share the gospel with? And then give me the boldness to do it and the words that I might share the hope that dwells in me of eternal life. I would encourage you to pray that every day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We thank you for your incredible love, your grace, and your mercy. And I thank you, Lord, that as we look at those who are the workers of the field, that that which you will bless with is really based upon your sovereignty, based upon your choice, how you want to pay, how you want to give. But I do know this, you're fair, you're just, and you give to all of us more than we deserve. You give us 
hope, you give us life, you give us eternal life. Lord, there's just so much that we get from knowing you and serving you. Lord, bless us as we go this week. Help us. Help us, Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Go with us now and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand, please? Wow. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. To be the servant of all, and to be the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be the servant of all, learn to be the servant of all, learn to be the servant of all, if you want to be great in God's kingdom. And the best way to learn is to be a servant, and he will teach you. He's the best teacher. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.